Welcome to the Enterprise Sessions. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Shelby Temple, who is CEO and co-founder of Azul Optics. Shelby, thank you very much indeed for your time. It's a pleasure. Um, so I'm really looking forward to exploring Azul's story, where you've come from, where you're going and so on. But perhaps we could just start with um, a bit about your background, what brought you to Bristol, what brought you to the UK? Um, I think an opportunity came up to explore research in a, in a key lab that was doing sort of cutting edge research. And I, and I just, that's what I was following anyway. So there was no question of where it was. It was just, is it the right, is it the right research that's going on? Am I doing the right thing? And, and I'll put up with wherever I'm located. Um, but to be fair, I came from Australia in the middle of summer um, to come here in the middle of winter. And it was quite a, a, ch a challenging change for myself and my family. <laughs> I could imagine. And yet, here you are some years later. So there must have been some charm yeah. of the, the lab, the city, the country. I fell in love with Bristol, to be honest, as did my son. So a whole family did. And it's it's been really nice being here. We didn't know anything about Bristol before we came. And arriving here was a pleasant surprise. Brilliant. Thank you. Not an uncommon story, actually. I feel much the same. Um, super. So tell me a little bit about Azul Optics. Maybe we'll start with the research that led you to spin out your company and maybe in doing so, was it always your plan to spin out a company? Or did that happen <laughs> by chance? I think probably many people would say it's by chance. I think in this space anyways, um, I didn't intend to. It was serendipity for sure. Um, I was researching polarization vision in fish and aquatic animals, um, particularly octopus and cuttlefish. And I sort of in doing so, um, I had to create special monitors to show these animals polarized light, which we don't typically see very well. And it just so happened that when I looked at these monitors, I noticed that I could see strange patterns. And I thought, well, that's intriguing. And, and I started testing colleagues and, and students and noticed that there was variability in the way that they could see these patterns on these monitors, which meant that there was some underlying variability in the human ability to see this. And it was sort of one of those situations where if I had just been sticking to my research protocol, the grants and everything else that we said we would do, I would have ignored this. But because I'm curious and excited and interested in other things, I thought, actually, this is worth exploring. And what we discovered was that what we were sort of uh, measuring by mistake was this pigment in the human eye. And that pigment is protective against long-term damage to the retina. And so I sort of thought, well, hang on a second. We've got this totally new way of measuring a pigment. Maybe this is worth exploring as, a, as an enterprise of some kind and, and spinning out. So that's kind of where it came from. And as I say, it wasn't planned. It wasn't intentional. It just sort of happened. And we followed the route of least resistance to see whether we could make something of it. I had sort of been planning to go down and stay in the academic route. And that was my intention all along. And I had good success all the way through. And at this point, I think I realized that there was elements of academia that didn't sit quite right with me. The, the push towards getting these big grants and um, and, and it was becoming very businesslike. You had to have, you had to follow what was hot topic at the day. And I thought, if I'm going to do research in a businesslike way, why not just have a business? And I think that's part of what allowed me to sort of push my way out. And there was also some great funding opportunities. So um, Set Square was coming along with their research and innovator program. I did an eye cure program. Um, then I had, we had a BBSRC Enterprise Fellowship. And each of these things gave me more freedom. So there was funding there to support different activities uh, and kind of second me into give tasters. I got to put my toes in the water without giving up my possibility of an academic career, but allowing me the space and time to explore those options and to see what it looked like. And each step of the way, I, I got myself deeper and deeper in and felt like, actually, this is a really exciting. And I think it's partly that sort of curiosity to try new things. I kept sort of going, well, this is totally new. I've done that. And I, I think I've been successful, but I want to try this. So I think that's what kind of moved me down that path and, and gave me the space to do it. I'm really glad you raised that because I think there's there's often this viewpoint in the academic community that if you're going to go down to commercial routes, you have to just jump. Mm. One day you're an academic, one day you're not. And and there are people that do that. But I I think if that was our only model, there'd be a huge number of innovations that would never make it because to take that step is quite scary, actually. So what you've described, what I've understood you to describe is mechanisms that existed that allowed you as an academic to try on these clothes of the commercial person from a relatively safe 
position of you could have retreated and said, actually, no, academia is the thing for me. Is that how it felt? Did that help you on that journey? Yeah, I'd say that's very much what it was because each of the programs got you, as I say, a little bit deeper into it. And at any point, and, and they were designed in such a way that you learn from them. So the Research Innovator Program through Set Squared was fantastic because it, it got you to think about being an innovator. But innovator doesn't mean starting an enterprise, starting a company. It could just mean more innovative grant or different style of research. So the skills I was learning, I could quite easily say, actually, no, I can put this into my research. I can, I can use this to write a better grant or whatever else I'm doing. So that was like one step. And then the iCure program was another step where it's a bit deeper. You're, you're thinking more about, is there a market for what I'm doing? But it, once again, you need to think about, is there a, a, a space for your research? And really doing market research for your research is not a bad idea. So each of these steps I could see, I could easily have pulled back in. And then I might still continue on an academic career at some point. So all of those things are learning steps. And I always felt that they were adding value to my life and what I was doing. So. I'm a massive advocate of IQ. I've done IQ with my company as well. And I think it's such a useful program. I know it's expanded a lot from its early sort of ambitions that were just a few universities. So tell me a little bit about what's what does your company do or make, putting it really bluntly? Mm. What, what's, your, what's your output? Yeah. So we build a device that measures an element of the human eye, which is a pigment that you get only from your diet. And this pigment is there to protect your retina against um, violet blue light, which is the most harmful part of light that gets to the back of the eye. And it also acts as an antioxidant. Um, so this pigment is really difficult to measure. It's sort of like a, a thin layer of apple juice on a glass of water. Um, it's, it's really, um, it's hard to get to. And so there have been sort of half a dozen different techniques that have been developed to try and measure the macular pigments, but they are often challenged by them being quite complex, being difficult to use, being very expensive. And our technology was really simple. It was really, really easy. We used the eye um, to as the sensor, and we had the pigments create a shadow on the retina. And so you use your, the shadow of your own number of amount of pigments as the sort of way of measuring how much pigment you have. So it's a very simple technology. And so we built a device that made that as easy as possible. And we focused on ease of use. So the idea being that the technology uh, gives you a number from one to 10, really simple, 10 is good, one's bad. Um, it's fast, it takes less than a minute. So the idea being that anybody could run this device. And in fact, we even made a self test device. So you could stick it in the, in the office, in the shop, and a person could come up and the video would talk them through how to test themselves. And in a couple of minutes, they'd have an answer. So we, it's, it's a physical device that we've made um, that sort of allows optometrists to start a conversation around prevention and long-term prevention, protect someone's eyes. And part of that conversation includes things that the person could do to protect their, their eye through life. And some of those things are products. So the optometrist then gets the benefit of selling something that helps pay for having this device in their time. So that's sort of the, the, the product that we have. It's a, it's a device, it's a medical device that helps engage patients in a conversation around prevention. Fascinating. So is your, is your vision, probably not the right word to use, but is your vision that sort of high street optometrists would, would have one of these as part of their suite of tests they do when... Um, somebody goes in to, to have their eyes checked is to sort of add it to the list of things that they would routinely do. Yeah, that's the plan. And, and that's where the models fit really well. So we have got, um, we sold about 250 units around the world. Mm -hmm. And optometrists that have it, once they put it in place, it's the challenge is always getting over it. It's a change, right? So you're, you're asking someone to do something slightly different. So they need to understand why are they going to do this different test? What's important about it? What, why should I fit it in? Why should my patients want to do it? Um, and once you can get over that and they see the benefits, suddenly they go, okay, now I get it. Now we're having a conversation that we weren't having before. And I think for me that one of the big perks of doing what I did was seeing these um, optometrists grab something new, bring it into their, their patient journey and then go, okay, I don't know how I live, and live with how I live without this before. Why wasn't I doing this before? And to me, that that's everything. And then, you know, and, and then seeing patients taking action based on what they've learned is is the the net outcome. So as a researcher, you want your your research to have impact. So to know that I have a device out there in all these different practices that's getting people to think differently about their eye health and do something about it, to me, that's I'm already successful, no matter what else happens. What about the commercial team that you then built? So you went through the uh, Research to Innovate, you went through iCure. Did you identify skills or functionalities that you wanted to get around you that you either didn't have yourself or, or didn't want to become an expert in? Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, right away it was pretty clear that I didn't have obviously a, a grounding in business, um, and I got very lucky. So um, around the time that I was looking to start a company, um, we, my wife was at the school talking to another mom, and she was talking to a person whose husband was trying to get out of the business that he was in and looking to do something different. He was going to take a bit of a sabbatical six month break. And so they got us to sort of sit down one night, have a beer and chat together. And it turned out that he was sort of the yin to my yang. Um, whereas I was very much the scientist and the sort of the problem solver. He was very much the sort of business minded uh, programming software, um, had much more of the process and the, and the, and the um, project management side that I certainly didn't have. And so we came together to found the company, and that was a that was amazing because the team you have with you, it can be very lonely to try to do it on your own, and and to have an idea and try to drive other people to join you. So being able to inspire someone like that to join me was a big, huge step. And so we founded the company together, and then we made all of our decisions together after that, which was great because we were able to look at you know where were we lacking, what were we missing, and how could we bring the best people to that team to support us, and and that was really critical. And I really like your description of your business partner as the yin to your yang, because I think it's very easy to recruit in your own image, if you like, to sort of naturally lean towards working with people who are like you, whether it's deliberate or, or just a sort of a, a gut reaction thing. But obviously, that's not what you've done in this instance. Mm. Do you think that was important? It was vital. Um, you know, um, I had only met this person once before, and we agreed to do something that can be very, very difficult. It's like a marriage, actually. We frequently called each other one another's wives. Um, and at one point, you know, I, I took him to Paris on a business trip and my wife had not been to Paris on a business <laughs> trip yet. And she was very disappointed and she wanted a better relationship. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, um, it was really important. And I think the being able to work closely with someone who's quite different. I mean, it wasn't without its challenges. We would often argue tirelessly about things and, and quite loud. And some of the other employees would kind of go, oh my gosh, get out of the room, this is crazy. But actually it was really important because we were usually saying the same thing, but within a different language. Interesting. And we often would end up getting to the same point. But in the process of getting there, we would have learned so much more about what it means from both sides of the argument. And so I think that in not being afraid to, to have those arguments, to, to raise your voice, to, to, you know, to challenge things, to think differently was really, really important in the process. Maybe we didn't need to raise our voice quite as much as we did, but um, you know, we, we are still really, really good friends, even though our, you know, we've gone slightly different routes now. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really critical to the success of the business for sure. Have you changed your, I don't know, your, your approach to your business? If you were to found a new spin out company, mm -hmm. Would you know things now through that relationship that you didn't know when you started? Has it sort of changed your perspective? Or do you still think you're the scientist engineer and you need that business person to be your complement? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how much you learn along the way. And um, I think yeah, I, I would... I certainly would not start a business in isolation. I wouldn't want to be the person in a business. Um, and you know, I became the CEO a little bit by default. It, it, I wasn't CEO when I started. I was a sort of the science officer. We had a CEO. The relationship didn't really work out, and so we, we we changed that. And I became the CEO because I was the the next. You know, I was the person who had all the knowledge and and could represent our company in a in a scientific space. Optometry does have the medical device space does require that you have a lot of science behind that. And so I was the right choice, but I didn't want to be. I mean, I really wanted my co-founder who's more business-minded to be the the, 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 role, the person in the front. Um, but it worked out. And and I think if I, were, if I were to do it again, yeah, the team would be the most important part, actually. So I, I don't think I would start a business without having exactly the right people around me. I'm really glad you raised the point that you started off as the chief science officer and moved to CEO. It is sometimes said, I have been told to my face that scientists and academics or past academics don't make good CEOs. And I absolutely refute that. And here's another example, and I've met others as well, that particularly if your, your, your customer base is scientifically minded, educated, founded, I think scientists can make fantastic CEOs. I know of a number of examples, and you mm. just give me one more. Thank you for that material. <laughs> so where is Azul now? And where would you like it to be in, well, you pick the time scale, one year, two years, <laughs> 10 years. Where, where is it now? And where would you like it to get to? Yeah. So we've taken this crazy idea from cuttlefish and octopus research, turned it into a medical device, put it into the market, 
shown what it can do, shown that it can change patient behavior, shown that it can help optometrists, shown that it can sell more product for big multinational companies. And our plan was always to, so, you know, we knew we couldn't survive as a medical device company with one product. Uh, and we weren't really intending to develop more. So we always knew it was going to get acquired by someone. And so we're now at the phase where we've sort of done everything we can do. We've exhausted our potential. You know, we've done everything we would do as a, a research and development company. And it's now in the situation where it's ready to be acquired. And we have the sort of full evidence base for that. Um, so we're in the process of selling the company now, which is again, a really great learning experience. You know, it's a whole new phase of, of the process. And I feel really privileged to have got this far, to have gone through each of those steps and to now be at the point of going, okay, what does this look like? What does selling a company look like? And that's, yeah, really another fun part of the journey. Brilliant. Uh, and so if I answer my own question from a couple minutes ago, fast forward five years, Azul mm. has sold for a really lovely sum. And, <laughs> and maybe you're even capitalized to do the next spin out or startup. Would you do it again? Yeah, in a heartbeat. Yeah, I really enjoyed the process. I learned so much. Um, and it's such an adventure. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I... I I thought I've been an academic for so long and I, you know, the pressures of academia were high and, it, you know, but actually I found that business was even higher. Like it was really, really difficult. And um, I wouldn't do it again if I had to go back in time and do it again, mm -hmm. because there was some sacrifices that I made that I can't get back. Mm -hmm. um, but I would definitely do it again in the future. It was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So tell me, Shelby, looking forward, maybe in the longer term, what would you like to be the legacy of of your work with Azul? Mm. I think I would love to know that some proportion of the devices that are out there now that we've made and sold and are, and are being used continue to be used for years to come and that each of them has an impact on people's lives. That that the sort of the, the heart of what I set out to do with this was to help people and educate people. I love educating people. And so if that device is a piece of that education and it continues to do so, and it affects the hopefully thousands of lives that it will affect, to think that we could extend people's vision through life for longer would be a real success for me. So I, I would love to walk into an optometry practice 10 years from now and have the optometrist offer to use my device to measure my own eyes. Yes. That would be a thrill. <laughs> would you tell them that it was yours? Afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd test them first and see how they do with the test. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Make sure they're doing it right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's all for this enterprise session. But join us again soon to hear more about the way our amazing staff and students are translating their enterprising ideas into real world impact. And do please click on the links if you'd like to contact the University of Bristol. <laughs>